Good evening, and welcome to the web seminar on best practices in outpatient joint replacements. I'm Joe Tamaro. I'm the general manager of Accelero Health Partners, and I will be co-presenting tonight along with Dr. Hartspan. Accelero Health Partners is the consulting division of Zimmer. We work with hospitals and surgeons and ambulatory surgery centers, both here in the United States as well as internationally, to deliver value in orthopedic care. We focus specifically on joint replacement, fragility fracture care, as well as spine care. There's been a lot of changes that have occurred in healthcare, and those changes that have occurred in healthcare are beginning to have an impact on joint replacement care. Payers are looking for the most cost-effective location to deliver care safely. And this has gotten many people to begin to think about outpatient joint replacements. A lot of these changes, again, people can see as a threat. We look at those as an opportunity. Especially when you begin to see this greater population having or wanting or needing joint replacement care, a younger population that wants to avoid a hospital stay, decreasing lengths of stay for joint replacement population due to changes in pain management and other types of protocols, all of this has really gotten people to begin to think about doing outpatient joint replacement. Now, I've had the opportunity of talking to a lot of different surgeons across the country and they look at this as almost a leap into outpatient joint replacements. My advice to everybody out there tonight is that don't think about this as a leap, and if you are going to leap, make sure you look before you leap. And what you should look at is look at your current processes and think about this instead of a leap as a gradual transition from your current joint replacement care to then doing outpatient joint replacements. One of the best pieces of advice comes from an abstract done by Dr. Berger and his team in 2009. And, you know, some of the key parts of that in the, in the first paragraph, he says, we recommend initially beginning by reducing the length of stay in a large cohort of patients from three to four days to two days. Keep in mind that in 2009, three to four days was the typical length of stay. They go on to say is once this has been successfully implemented, then it's recommended that you have some careful selection and intense monitoring of healthy patients that can have a one-day hospitalization. And then only after this, then you can begin to think about a next-day discharge and then a same-day discharge. So outlined in here in 2009 was the advice of how do you gradually move this patient population from a two-day to a one-day to a same-day discharge okay, in the right patients. Tonight, we're going to address outpatient joint replacement from a business perspective, a clinical perspective, and a process perspective. I'm pleased to be joined tonight by Dr. Mark Hartspan. Dr. Hartspan has performed well over 600 outpatient joint replacements in a true ambulatory setting, and he's been doing this since 2008, and has been performing and has performed about 2,500 outpatient joint replacements in a hospital setting. Thanks, Dr. Hartspan, for your time tonight. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you guys for uh, calling in. Uh, this is a slide from one of my early lectures on ambulatory joint replacement. And uh, there was not much interest back in 02 when I began to perform them in a hospital setting. And obviously the interest in this uh, kind of procedure has increased dramatically uh, over the last few years with the change in landscape. Uh, in orthopedics and medicine, and the, as Joe said, the changes in the way patients are recovering with the multiple changes in the procedures from the technique to the medications to the uh, preoperative setup and postoperative protocols. Uh, I've been in a high volume uh, joint practice, uh, I've been in practice for 31 years. It's been a high volume joint replacement practice for just over 20 years or so. And I began in the mid-90s to begin to shrink my uh, mini, my posterolateral approach incisions. And uh, this began in the original days we used to modify existing instruments uh, with vice grips and uh, clamps in the basement. Uh, and uh, in around 2002, uh, it, the technique was embraced by sequentially by a number of orthopedic vendors, and much better instruments became available. Uh, in 2000, or early 2000, we published a, a, in CORE a series of patients from 
uh, again, you see now about 15 years ago, who were so-called minimally in, uh, minimal uh, posterior lateral incision. So we define them as between 6 and 8 centimeters quite, very arbitrarily. Uh, and it happens that in that group, the mean was just over 7 centimeters. Uh, and in that group of patients, our length of stay was, was reduced to 2.89 days. So again, that was 15 years ago when the length of stay typically was approaching a week in this country. Uh, our transfusion rate, this was in the time when everybody gave a unit or two of autologous blood preoperatively. And only a third of those patients received their autologous blood because of the decrease in bleeding that was uh, as a consequence of the approaches and the anesthesia changes that we'll discuss. And again, I work with a very uh, well-rehearsed team of consistent nurses and staff and anesthesia, so our operative times are, are expectedly uh, fairly short. Uh, in 2002, I was fortunate enough to be invited into the two incision project very early. Uh, I got out to see Rich Berger at that time, anticipating that I would be uh, disappointed and return home, uh, but I was really all surprised and impressed and a little overwhelmed uh, by his efficiency and how his patients were able to consistently leave the same day and that it was not smoke and mirrors. And, uh, and, and I began to do them shortly thereafter. And uh, adopting, with his help at that time, uh, changes in pain uh, protocol, pain management in particular, uh, we were able to consistently send people home the same day after a very short series of longer stays. And uh, eventually I did uh, about a 1,000 uh, two incision hips with a very consistent same-day discharge. Uh, what I did, as time went on, the two incision kind of fell into some uh, controversy, I think primarily retrospectively because of instrumentation. But it was the people who had the most success with that procedure used a fully coated six inch cylindrical diaphyseal engaging stem. And over the last 13 years, I think stem technology has evolved and very few of us still use cobalt chromium stem as a primary alternative for most cases. And I drifted back to post the mini posterior, which we continue to improve, I think. Uh, and that remains the approach that I continue with today. What I did find, though, is that I was progressively frustrated by uh, multiple obstacles that were uh, create element, you know, uh, constructed in front of me to prevent patients from leaving the hospital the same day. Uh, the institution initially had uh, stated that they couldn't get therapy as often as I wanted because uh, of their apparent inability, uh, lack of availability of an uh, adequate number of therapists. Uh, and it took a very long time, a number of years, and a lot of uh, phone calls, at least, to say the least, to finally get them to begin performing physical therapy in the recovery room because I was in a busy institution at that time, which often had a long recovery room hold waiting for bed. And uh, it was presented as a safety issue or a lack of staffing issue. And uh, today, when the patients are neurologically intact and the spinal is worn off, those patients are ambulated and taken out of bed. The hospital uh, postured it, that it had a financial disincentive to same-day discharges, which, in fact, is not necessarily true, and Joe will probably address that more. I'm not the guy to tell you about that, but uh, the, the people at, uh, at Rush, for example, have been braced same-day discharges for many, many years now uh, and continue to maintain a profit. Uh, I think really there's a, a, the most important things, and you can see that I increased my font as I went along based on the importance of these things. I think there's a time-honored institutional resistance to change that is really what pushed me out of the hospital for some of my cases. Uh, 
people don't like to change what they've been doing. And the bigger the institution and organization, the less they like to change it. Uh, and in spite of having excellent nurses at that institution, there were nurses who were wonderful at nursing, but who couldn't help themselves by, but to stop from whispering to patients, for example, prior to their planned discharge that afternoon, that, you know, I, we, I don't really think you should leave today. Or, you know, Dr. Hartsman is the only one who does this. I don't know what's the matter with that. Uh, and as we'll discuss as we go on, same day, hospital, same day surgery is more than just the surgery or the medication uh, or the physical therapy. It's, a, it's the way these patients are prepared for surgery from the minute you meet them in your office and you decide in your own mind that they may be a good candidate. And it's the way the operation is explained. Operation is still the, the details and risks and benefits are explained in detail in my practice. Uh, but the, the, that whole uh, philosophy of being able to safely go on the same day and have minimal discomfort and a manageable recap uh, is something that can be derailed, especially in the early days when you're first setting it up, by a well-meaning but not well educated in, in to this kind of matter, a nurse or discharge planner or physical therapist. Uh, and, and, and that was really the final straw for me, uh, that made me go to outpatient. So what Dr. Hartspan has just described is what we see in a lot of situations where surgeons uh, know that from a clinical perspective they can do this procedure as an outpatient, but there are different things going on in their current setting that prevent them from doing that. One of the areas that we want to address tonight is the business case, because what I find is I've talked with surgeons is this is the point where they know they want to look at these alternative settings for outpatient for joint replacement, but they want to make sure that the business case is there. And what we encourage is you think about the business case in a couple different ways. First of all, you think about it from a surgeon versus the facility. Second, looking at reimbursement and cost, and third, what do you know and what are the unknowns out there? And there's a lot of those unknowns that are out there. So let's talk first of all from the surgeon's perspective. The surgeon's reimbursement does not vary depending on if they do the case as an inpatient or as an outpatient and depending on the setting. Okay, there's no variance in what you get paid as a surgeon. What you have to look at though is to make sure that you're in the best possible environment to do those cases effectively and efficiently. Now, What's important is to understand the facility perspective of this. And what do we know? Well, for the most part right now, we know that Medicare does not pay for outpatient joint replacements. So largely, we're looking at non-Medicare payers. However, Medicare does pay for an outpatient unicondular joint replacement. They've been paying for that for a number of years, and I'll show you in just a bit the facility payment for that. In 2012, Medicare added a CPT code for outpatient total joint replacement, okay, but for now they have not assigned a reimbursement to it. So for total joint replacements, Medicare does not reimburse the facility. However, for unicondular joint replacements, you can see from this chart that Medicare reimburses the outpatient hospital $10,220. Okay, and they reimburse if it's done in an ASC, $8,396. Now, in the upcoming years, Medicare is absolutely going to bring their cost or their reimbursement, excuse me, to the outpatient hospital down to the ASC level. So you'll see these two lines come together and, and it'll be lower than what you're seeing. So what you can begin to think about from a reimbursement perspective is, we know that in, on average, Medicare pays about $12,000 to the hospital for an inpatient joint replacement. We know that for outpatient unis, they pay somewhere between $8,000 and $10,000 to the facility. So you've got to begin to look at that and say, are we getting reimbursed enough or can we get reimbursed enough from a non-Medicare payer for this to be a good margin in the ambulatory surgery center? Well, to do that, you have to understand your cost. So this slide outlines the traditional model where you as a surgeon are getting paid what you would typically get paid. And from the facility perspective, we believe that when you look at OR time supplies, recovery implant, for that day surgery, 
that your cost will be somewhere around $6,700, which means that you have to have a payer paying you okay, to get a margin of $3,000, somewhere around $9,700. If your margin, if your goal is to have $4,000 of a margin, $10,700 and $5,000, $11,700. Just, again, a model to begin to think about this. If you, have a pay, if you have a payer in the region, from the facility perspective, that's going to reimburse you around $11,000 based upon what we think those costs could be, this could be a good margin product. Especially if you're a facility and you begin to think, if you're doing an outpatient um, knee scope or rotator cuff repair, your reimbursement or your margin, excuse me, typically on that is somewhere between two and $3,000. You definitely want to make sure these are higher margin cases, these joint replacement cases. Okay, so that's an example of taking an understanding of what your costs are, beginning to look at what reimbursement is for the facility, okay, and begin to put yourself into a good business perspective. Now, ultimately, where payers are going with this is thinking about payment in a global perspective and paying one payment for the entire episode of care. We've heard a lot about this in inpatient joint replacement bundle payment. In fact, this slide shows, and this is for total hip replacement, uh, and this is data from Medicare. This is what Medicare pays out for a total hip replacement, including to the hospital, to the surgeon, readmission costs, post-discharge care. You can see that that number varies between $17,784 to $24,693. So that's a, that's a big difference as far as what Medicare pays out for inpatient total joint replacement. Again, knowing and looking at some of these known factors to look at the business case. Another example that's shown on this slide is that when we look at Blue Cross Blue Shield, they recently put out a study that received a lot of airplay a few weeks ago in USA Today and in other places that showed that their cost, what they pay out for a joint replacement at a hospital, varies tremendously market to market. And they also showed that it varied within markets. So as, example, as an example, highest paying total cost for an inpatient joint replacement to a hospital in New York City, $61,000. That includes the facility, surgeon reimbursement, any of the post-discharge care, everything involved. So you see a very wide range. So when we come into markets and work with surgery centers and physicians, the first question that they'll have to us is that what do you see as typical reimbursement for outpatient joint replacement? Well, again, on a non-Medicare payer, this is evidence that that reimbursement is all over the place. What we recommend, though, is that you look at setting this up as an entire episode of care, even though maybe early on you're only thinking about this as delivering surgeon getting paid, facility getting paid. But at some point, you need to think about this as an episode of care payment. So let's look at this on this slide. If we take what we had before, the overall, you know, cost, the traditional uh, facility cost of $6,700, and then you add in all of the other services, we believe that the cost for all of those together will vary and be somewhere around $5,600. So the total cost would be $12,300. So if you're looking at making a margin of three or four, five, six thousand dollars $6,000 on this total episode of care, you can see what your reimbursement needs to be. And the two slides before this that showed what Medicare pays for an out for an inpatient joint replacement total cost and what Blue Cross is playing as a bundled episode of care payment, you can see there's a lot of opportunity to make margin from a business perspective. All right. So that in summary of this section, you know, there's again a lot of unknowns on the business side. The biggest unknown is the reimbursement from non Medicare payers. But if you take what you know and truly understand your cost, Okay, we believe that it's possible to set up an appropriate and a good business model that's fair to you as a facility, fair to the surgeon, as well as fair to the payer. Okay, now, with the business case being delivered, let's go back to and talk with Dr. Hartspan now about his delivery method as he moved his cases into the outpatient environment. Okay. So, uh, you know, again, I had done well over a 1,000 same-day discharge hip replacements at that time uh, from my hospital with a great deal of work at phone calls and monitoring. And I had just gotten frustrated enough and was walking through the OR corridors one day 
I guess in April of 08, and was approached by a urologist that had it, what was at that time a failing unit in my neighborhood, and asked if I had any interest in coming in. And uh, it's not anything I had ever looked at. Uh, but I thought about it for about five minutes, and I decided yes. And uh, I initially had anticipated only getting a case or two a month for, you know, uh, that I could indicate for it. But over time, that number had gone, has gone up significantly. So we actually did our first case on June 6th of 08. And this date is from about six months ago. Uh, we did a total of 560, we've done, I've done a total of 567 total general arthroplasty patients in that period of time. None of these have been unicompartmentals, just because I don't do many unicompartmentals. Uh, of the 440 hip replacements, my first nine were two incisions, which I had not done for a number of years. But I went back to that procedure because traditionally, historically, it was the hip replacement uh, approach that most consistently got my patients home the same day. And uh, I don't know how many of you out there have done two incisions, but I, was, I always had a pretty good, easy time of it, but occasionally they can really present a problem. And I, the ninth case was more of a grunt than I was prepared to embark on uh, or to repeat. And I went back to my mini posteriors, and I've done a 431 of those subsequently. Uh, probably in 2010, I began to do knee replacements, which I was initially a little more concerned about, just in terms of pain management and wound uh, observation. Uh, but I have found that they do just as well as the total hip replacements, and, and I've done 127 of those, all with a mini quads uh, sparing incision, not a true traditional MIS incision of the early 2000s that we used to use, uh, as I find this works best for me. And my percentage of knee replacements is, is constantly increasing. It is a, it happens to be a three operating room unit. And I've, I've been working, I've been working out of two ORs inpatient from, since, uh, I would think 2000 or so, for at least 15 years. Uh, so two, when I'm there at that unit, two or all three of those units are at my disposal. Uh, you need to have multiple anesthesiologists at your disposal to make all the ownership of two or more rooms uh, economic. So uh, we, I have an anesthesiologist for each room. Uh, in this building, there happens to be a full x-ray department with a PET scanner in the, on, in the basement that pre-existed us. So uh, it's nice because I do have fluoroscopy on the premises in the event of a situation where I would want one. Uh, it was useful for the two incisions, obviously. Uh, and it's, it's a nice luxury to be able to get post-op x-rays that day, you know, immediately from recovery room, have them sent down in a wheelchair and brought back up. There is also a second a top floor on the building that has a, phys a good physical therapy unit that I'm familiar with on that floor. Uh, and uh, so I have the luxury of having a therapist on, on premises that I can, who will come down and ambulate my patients generally beginning about 40 minutes post-operatively and return five or six times during that day. We'll go do steps, we'll walk around the building if it's nice, uh, and they will routinely be discharged by five or six o'clock. When I initially started to do outpatient, particularly with respect to my knee replacements, uh, I thought it was important to have a working relationship with a blood bank. And that was e really e fairly easily developed. And initially, for all my knees outpatient, I had patients, I went back to pre-donating pre -donating autologous blood. Uh, I, have, I no longer do this, and although we still have an agreement with a blood bank, and I can, could bring in blood on a given case that I desire, uh, we do not routinely bring in blood for anybody. So, you know, the and, and it's key consideration that is patient selection. So again, Dr. Hartman, from a facility perspective, the selection is really key. Now, as I mentioned earlier, you've a certain percentage of that 
population, that 32% from 65 to 74 and the 23% 65 and above, you've got to recognize that Medicare doesn't pay the facility in certain places, and Dr. Hartspan will talk about this, it, it doesn't necessarily, you know, make a difference depending on the patient's insurance and, and, you know, to pay and types of things. If you want to consider this, Hartspan, go ahead and walk through some of your criteria and what you've seen through the years. So, you know, I have, because of my uh, interest in less invasive procedures that goes back quite a few years, I, 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 within my group, I tend to attract the younger, more type A motivated patients. And my in-office, in-hospital mean age is somewhere between 57 and 58. My ASC mean age is, has been 55. The range has been wide from 22 to 71. I've done a fair number of Medicare patients, but at this point, they have to be very motivated and well healed. Uh, hopefully that will change in the next year or so, as Joe said. Uh, almost none of my patients have no comorbidities. Uh, and the mean has been one, I would think it's probably closer to two today, as my threshold for comorbidities uh, has gone uh, up. The surgical time, again, has been brief. Uh, I am perhaps a little more meticulous about hemostasis in an outpatient setting, so they take a few minutes longer. But the time has been consistently less than an hour. So then from the standpoint of preoperative preparation, you know, the most important part of this is the patient education and setting expectations. Again, if you're a surgeon and you're looking to do this in the ambulatory surgery center, creating those processes within your practice are going to be key from the standpoint of patient education, clearance, potentially involved with the patient, somebody that you can talk to on a regular basis, home notification early, all of those will be important. If you're looking to do these in a hospital setting, you know, these patients aren't going to work out well in your traditional joint classes. You're going to have to those processes and walk through your preoperative components and how you think about that decision-making component. So I think this is one of the keys of this, of doing this. You really have to be able to select out who to offer this to and who not to offer this to. And nobody is pushed in my practice one way or another. But there are patients who I decide on meeting them or on examining them or taking their history or getting a sense about them that they are or are not candidates. Today, Medicare patients uh, are not candidates unless there's a special extenuating circumstance or they verbalize that that's what they're interested in regardless of their insurance status. Uh, I look for patients who are motivated, who have a healthy home situation in that, and by that I mean that they have somebody around or can have somebody around, even if it's a brother or friend, uh, for a few days, because I don't think people should go home or be completely alone. You can't have 112 steps to get up to your fourth floor apartment uh, in a no elevator building. So you have to have some reasonable access. I have no problem with stairs. But it's got to be a reasonable amount of stairs. It's got to be an environment that is safe to be in with a fresh surgical procedure of any sort. Uh, you know, Bob Booth has a very well-known lecture about people who live with their parents or, you know, have 17 cats. And you, you, everybody makes their own, uh, and I love cats, but everybody makes their own judgment about who is the right person to do this for. If somebody asks me that they initially about how long they can stay in a rehab center, then those patients are not candidates in my mind for outpatient, no matter what their age or ease of their surgical procedure is. Uh, and the education for this begins in my practice, which although it's a busy practice, uh, is a very mom and pop practice. So it begins with my initial consult and my assessment of who that patient is and uh, a quick glance at their insurance sheet to know that they have a, a policy that will cover this event for them in an outpatient setting. Uh, and I present the procedure to them, and I present the fact that pain, for example, with a hip replacement, nowadays is a trivial part of that operation. 
Uh, I explained to them that they're going to be managed with multiple uh, multiple drug regimen, which we'll discuss in more detail shortly. Uh, that they should not ever have severe pain. Uh, that they're never going to get IV narcotics for this pain, whether they're home or in a hospital. And that they will be safe and be able to bear, bear weight and be ambulatory. Uh, my office staff and scheduling people reinforce that notion. We have printed literature that we wrote, uh, not purchased, prefabricated, that reflects our office protocols that these patients are given. Uh, there's website information uh, and things like that. I, I know Joe had mentioned a, a joint camp or course. And even in a hospital, and I know that there are regulations required some kind of formal education now for certain insurance uh, statuses. And uh, But I will tell you that I don't allow my patients to go to the hospital sponsored joint camp because by nature of, of a hospital and having a wide diversity of interests and, and, and uh, goals in its surgical staff, a joint camp has to apply itself and its recommendations to the range of attending in that institution. And again, if you present this as a same-day event, you can't bring them into a room with 30 people and be told by a person who is designated as knowledgeable and authoritative that your hospital stay will be somewhere between one and five days or that you may or may not go to an inpatient rehab facility, uh, or you may or may not get a PCA pump, or a, and things like this, which will derail my plan. Uh, I think before you begin to do outpatient surgery, before you begin to do two patient OR setups, but certainly once you're leaving the, the installation, of, a, in, of your hospital, and you're bringing your work to a freestanding center, uh, you have to become pre a predictable surgeon. And it's not about how fast you are. Uh, it's about how consistent you are. So you have to know that a hip replacement is going to take you somewhere, or a knee replacement is going to be somewhere between 30 and 60 minutes. That it's not going to be a three and a half hour event uh, under any circumstances and that because you can't be efficient if you're not predictable. You can't manage rooms. You can't manage staff. You can't manage scheduling. Uh, and one of the things in the, our outpatient center is I like to be done by 12.30 or 1 o'clock so that I know those patients will be able to safely go home that evening. Uh, you have, there's a number of things you have to do along this pathway. Uh, you have to be you have to get the right OR staff. You have to find motivated and interested and talented people to scrub and to circulate. And I would say no one in my surgical center has had any pre training in arthroplasty scrubbing or circulating until I got there. And it just happened to be the right people who embraced it and wanted to do it and took pride in being one of the few places where it was being done at the time. Uh, and I would just suggest that you, you train them well and you listen to them because they often have a lot to say and some clever things that are out of left field that will help you be more efficient and more effective that you never would have thought of. Uh, as you ascend the scale of challenging goals is befriending anesthesia. So you have to find an anesthesiology group that has talented people who are willing to try something out of the box. They're, they're willing to embrace it and not be passive aggressive about it and not and be willing to to listen to new techniques and the reasons for doing that. And you also have to deal with your uh, implant vendors. You can't do four knee replacements that all end up to be the same size and all end up to be lefts and not have enough inventory. You can't do a hip replace. I won't do a hip replacement unless I have a bailout. So although I don't do a lot of Wagner's or fully coated stems as a primary hip, I have a fully coated stem there at all times when I operate. 
I have a Wagner series of increasing stem lengths there at all times at instruments. I have a set of cables there at all times because you need to have a way out even if you hopefully never use it. Uh, you have, so you have to have adequate implant inventory. You have to have adequate instrumentation. You have to prepare for dropping a femoral cutting jig and not having to wait for an autoclave to give, to give you it back. You have to have another one that's sterilely wrapped. You have to help them to help you by streamlining your operating setup. You have to get rid of all those instruments that you don't know the name of that look like they're on loan from the Smithsonian that are in every joint replacement tray because you're never going to use it if you don't know the name of it yet. Uh, get rid of the instruments you don't use. Make sure they get the right drapes, things like that. Uh, you have to arrange a sufficient supply of power tools, whether you're using nitrogen or battery. You have to have enough of them so you can drop a saw or a battery can go out or a hose blows so that you don't have to wait uh, precious time for another one to come. You also have to establish your protocols, and you have to have those really down because they'll be, they will be tested. You have to have your office staff, your medical assistants, your scheduling people, your front desk people, your PAs. Everybody has to know these protocols because you will go on vacation someday, and you have to know how to answer these questions. And that starts with preoperative and perioperative uh, protocols to the intra-op and immediate post-op protocols to the outpatient protocols. And this, again, I think Richard Bergen deserves, a lot of people claim credit for all these things, but he was certainly the first. And everything subsequent in my mind has been uh, modifications of his. So everybody gets a cocktail preoperatively on arrival to the recovery room or the input area of the surgery center. And these are the same as I do in the hospital. And I, if I don't say it again, I just remind you that the way to do this is not to take a leave, but to do it in your hospital first, whether or not you're going to leave the building at some point. And get good at it there where you have a little bit of a safety net. Everybody in my practice gets Celebrex preoperatively. Uh, there are a lot of people who are using Mobic now because kind of a blended COX-1, COX-2. Uh, I would give them samples from my office. Uh, if, if uh, their insurance doesn't cover it. I give them a Percocet or two preoperatively, depending on their drug history, the amount of they, if they were taking narcotics preoperatively, their size, and their anticipated discomfort. Everybody gets something to protect their stomach. Everybody gets Lyrica. Uh, I usually use 50 milligrams for the older people at a hospital and 75 to 100 milligrams in an outpatient setting where the mean age is younger. I've been using a scopolamine patch for many years. I find it very effective uh, in preventing nausea. It has to be applied an hour before the event. Uh, and I, for a knee only, I will give them Oxycontin, typically, although not always, either 10 or 20 milligrams, depending on their preoperative narcotic ingestion and their size. Um, this concept of normal volemic hemodilution is something that I had heard of since medical school, but I had never witnessed. That was one of the things that was recommended to me by the anesthesiologist on the first day that I started. Uh, and in doing this, when the patients are in the holding area recovery room, they take off a unit of blood and they replace it with crystalloid. And they take this blood and they put it in a, it's in a citrated bag and it goes into another bag that has ice chips in it. And it hangs there, and as I'm closing, that blood starts to be reinfused. And one of the early tricks of the two incision program was that we used to give patients back their blood preemptively on arrival to recovery before we got a hematocrit, because it, is, it helps very significantly eliminate any vasovagal episodes that used to Ten years ago happened 20% uh, of the time in the recovery room. And essentially, I don't recall ever having one happen in the outpatient center. We stopped using Foley catheters a few years ago. Uh, there's been a paper more recently by Rothman's group and Jay Parbizzi that shows that uh, that is probably the right thing to do. When I first started the center, there was the urology office upstairs, so I always assumed that they would run down and help us out if we needed it but we never had to avail ourselves of their services. 
Uh, I think every everybody gets Reglan preoperatively. Everybody gets Zofran preoperatively to prevent nausea to maintain uh, GI motility. I've been using Decadron for about five or six years now, uh, and they get a dose of Decadron preoperatively. They get appropriate antibiotics, and we can talk about that, but uh, the patients typically get a second dose before they leave. And if, if they're on a cephalosporin, they'll get two 500 milligram capsules of Keflex or another cephalosporin and be told to leave it on a night table uh, and take it first thing in the morning when they wake up. We've been using tranexamic acid for the last year or year and a half. Uh, a gram or two prior to the incision for the hips and a gram or two prior to tourniquet deflation, usually about 15 minutes of tourniquet time for the knees. With and that has really changed the – everybody who used it, I would think, feels the same way. Our transfusion rate has gone to zero uh, in and out of hospital for a primary joint replacement. Uh, and I would recommend it if you haven't used it. Uh, with respect to anesthesia, when we first started, we used a hyperbaric bupivacate spinal anesthesia, which is what was being used – is being used in the hospitals. The problem with the uh, bupivacate anesthetics is that they are occasionally uh, associated with an extended duration of anesthesia. So although I'm, we're planning on a rapid mobilization and ambulation, then occasional patient, either due to the dose administered by anesthesia, the volume, or the individual's neurologic characteristics, I'm not the guy to give you details on that, will have a prolonged action of three or four hours without motor control. Uh, and that caused us to change to a hyperbaric mixture of 5% lidocaine with 7.5% dextrose a few years ago, four years ago. Uh, the key with this anesthetic is that the solution is diluted one-to-one -one with CSF. So the anesthesiologist draws back an equivalent volume of CSF and then re-injects it slowly. There's a rare reported incidence, less than 1% of transient dysthesias with this anesthetic regimen. And I've had one in the 600 or so outpatient joints that had uh, there was a knee, but they had kind of a myalgia parasthetic syndrome for about two months that resolved uh, uneventfully. But you have to be aware of that. I think you need a heated IV fluid should be used wherever you are. You shouldn't be using cold bottles of IV fluid. You want to keep the patient warm, although anyone who's ever come to watch me will know that I keep the room really cold. But the patient is kept warm. Uh, I've been using a local infiltration of quarter percent cupivacaine with epi uh, since I began outpatient. Uh, in fact, uh, probably since around 2004. Uh, the, uh, I, I use a large volume. I, I have 120 cc's available. Uh, I'm not very neat with it. Uh, I probably waste about 40 percent of it. Uh, but I inject. Uh, Anterior capsule, iliosos tendon sheet, posterior capsule, uh, and then skin sequentially in a hip. In a knee, I inject, you know, posterior capsule, meniscal remnant, subperiosteally, and the incision in the quads, and the medial lateral retinaculum and tibial tuber and tibial tubercle patella tendon insertion. Over the last year or so, I've been using Expirel, the liposomally bound bupivacaine, only in knees, because I've never found hips have enough discomfort to justify consideration of anything more. Uh, and it is somewhat better, perhaps, than plain uh, Marcan and Epi, in that you may get another four or six hours. But I promise you that I had never gotten a phone call. I have never received a call. And everyone has access to me, unfortunately, uh, from a patient the night of surgery or even the next morning complaining of pain. Uh, the patients are much, I'll just go back to something I said before, these patients in part of their education, which is stressed over and over again and repeated on the day of surgery, both before and after, repeatedly to patient and family, 
is they have to be educated about when to take their oral pain medicine and to take it when the pain is a two and not when it's a five or six. And the difference in mechanisms of action and half-lives of a Percocet type drug versus an Oxycontin type drug. I've been giving patients heparin intravenous bolus prior to instrumenting canals of hips and knees uh, for probably 15 years uh, based on some data by Salvati many years ago that it prevented the clotting cycle from getting started, and I continue to do that uh, with no data. Uh, and I use, I like the transcalation cautery. It's expensive. If you're about the money, it's about $475, or if you're profit margin in a surgery center. I never did the surgery center about the money, so I continue to use it. Uh, because I think they're drier. And not only are drier wounds nicer uh, in terms of the bleeding issue, but they're much more comfortable and less painful. There's nothing worse than a tightly closed knee with a big hematoma. For the outpatient, I continue the same regimen. I use Percocet, I use Celebrex, I use Lyrica. Uh, there are a lot of anticoagulation regimen out there. Uh, this is the same regimen. I'm not, this is not the only one, and I'm not purporting that it's the best one, but it's what I like. Because I like the, I don't like low molecular heparin early. I don't like uh, Gerelto and those kind of drugs early. So I like Coumadin, and they get 10 milligrams on arrival to recovery, and they, they're sent home with a 5 milligram pad that they take at 5 or 6 a.m. in the morning when they wake up to go to the bathroom with their two antibiotic capsules. And then I switch them to low molecular heparin. And I get a Doppler at my office, which I've been doing for many years at the two-week visit, and if it's negative, they go to aspirin 225 BID for three months. I give them something for their stomach, uh, while they're on anticoagulation, everybody uses uh, venodyne, compression stockings, you know, TED stockings, uh, and everybody gets stool softeners. And everybody is in, asked preoperatively if they have a problem with constipation and our instructor on what to do to fix that before they come in. We use mechanical depression devices only in the recovery room. There are some home units now. Uh, I don't know that they're worth the trouble. Some insurers cover it, some don't. Uh, I have no problem. I'm not for or against that. But we use a foot pump for our knees, and we use an FTD for our hips, as I do in hospital. We use cryotherapy as really been a big help. I, I think that's made a bump in the pain management. And it starts in recovery, and the patients each go home with one. Uh, and the patients have been consistently discharged home no later than 6 p.m. This unit began as a 23-hour unit that preexisted my joining it, and they gave that uh, certification up about a year later because we had never used it. With respect to anticoagulation, I don't think it matters as long as you use a well-accepted protocol that works for you, that you know the complications of and that you know how to manage. Uh, with respect to discharge planning, and this was on Joe's list of things you have to clear up preoperatively, you have to be open-minded, you have to be flexible. If you're doing this in a hospital, uh, you have to make sure you make arrangements with them well in advance because the, still today, the routine pat answer of a discharge planner to a patient when they call with a question prior to surgery is that you're going to be there three days. And even in my institution, inpatient, that is still the answer they get. Uh, so you need your office to interface well with these people, and it's probably worthwhile that you go shake a hand and meet them and make sure everybody's on the same page. Uh, we happen to be in an area where I can avail myself of the ability to get five times a week home PT for two weeks postoperatively. And that is the standard order. Patients get a home therapist comes to them, and this is within at least a 100-mile area. It can be arranged out of state, because I do a lot of patients from Manhattan uh, or Connecticut, and we can arrange it there, too. And Joe's the guy to help you with that, because I, I just asked that it be done, and it, my office got it done. Uh, the, uh, I've had three patients that I can recall whose insurance was such that they would not authorize home with PT 
without a hospital stay of three days, uh, and which is one of the reasons. Well, but uh, it's uh, it's one of the many frustrations of medicine today. But I call, and I called all three of those patients preoperatively because you don't want that to be a surprise. And I explained the situation. And I offered them the same procedure in hospital within a day or so on either side of the schedule, and they all let me to have it at home anyway, and they've all done fine. We get a, get a visiting nurse who comes to the house the next day and checks their wound and will return as necessary. You must have frequent office contact. So I only do my outpatients on Monday, and I call everybody Tuesday morning on my way to work. And yeah, initially I had very early follow-up to check everyone, particularly the knees, I would see them on Thursday. But now everybody is back to my protocol of the first visit being two weeks post-op. So a couple points to emphasize on the post-operative, getting back to this process component of it. You know, one, the whole concept of this defined nursing and physical therapy protocols. And there's differences of what people want to do, but you have to have those defined. And then the other big part of it is just this discharge phone call piece of it. You have to have the processes in place as the patient leaves the surgery center to connect them with your practice between that time period and a traditional office visit. The last concept we want to talk about is this concept of outcomes. You need to have a framework in place. Payers want to see that you have a patient selection protocol, that you're saving costs, and they also want to see your outcomes. So measuring it from the standpoint of patient satisfaction, clinical components, operational components, functional outcomes, longer-term patient-related outcomes measures are important. You're going to run into some payers that aren't going to be interested in paying for this procedure, that you're going to have to look at some protocols that you do and collect those outcomes and then revisit that back with the payers. I think that's absolutely critical as you do the process. And wrapping up, why don't you talk a little bit about now your results that you've seen over this period of time. Okay, so I have had some complications. Uh, I had one early patient who was over with a knee that was over-narcotized, and she actually was in the middle of a divorce, and I was afraid her husband was trying to take her out. So I actually made a house call, I will admit, uh, and she came to the emergency room and was just observed for about six hours and her purpose that was confiscated. And she was discharged home and did well. I had two early hip dislocations, both actually anterior because I was so paranoid about posterior dislocations when I went back to posterior lateral hips. Uh, and they were diagnosed on x-ray and revised that day and still discharged on the same day. As you move people quicker, you're going to have more hematomas. Uh, and I have had two INDs, one in a hip and one in a knee for sterile hematomas. And I've had two uh, er, hem hip hematomas that cultured positive. And they were treated in the first four to six weeks. And were treated by a radical debridement, irrigation, direct primary exchange, and IV antibiotics at home for six weeks that have done well. There have been no emergency room hospital admissions in my initial experience, none. Uh, I can assure you my hospital would be gleeful on a raw greeting then. And I've had no transfers to an inpatient rehab facility. So before I began this uh, outpay true ASC surgery, I had spoken with an acute rehab facility and a subacute rehab facility in our area that see a significant volume from my practice. And I had dealt with the directors and gotten verbal, only verbal, commitments that if there were a patient who at 6 p.m. looked at the nurse with crazy eyes and said, I don't want to leave, that they would be willing to take these patients immediately from the uh, facility. I've never had to use that uh, bailout. I think the bottom line is Make sure you do, it's a, I wrote familiar surgical technique, but use a familiar surgical technique. Don't do your first direct anterior or mini posterior or whatever uh, in your surgery center for your first outpatient case. Get good at it in a hospital. There is not a steep learning curve. There's just a lot of the T's, I's that have to be dotted and T's that have to be crossed. There are, I think, a ton of patient benefits. About 60 of my patients had their initial joint done by myself with the 
same technique in a hospital within two or three years of the outpatient procedure. And every single one of them just loved the outpatient experience compared to an in-hospital experience. And I work in some very good hospitals. And I think as Medicare seems to be finally getting around to realizing, there are many potential benefits to the entire healthcare delivery system. Thanks, Dr. Hartspan, for your insight and for sharing your journey to outpatient total joint replacements. I think it's critical to understand that Dr. Hartspan began this journey nearly 15 years ago. He continues to refine his process since starting doing outpatient joints at the ASC in 2008. With all the changes occurring in the market and the real possibility of Medicare approving outpatient total joint payment in the next 18 months, you don't have eight years to refine this process. The provider that does outpatient joints well in the market and they do it first is going to win. At Accelero Health Partners, we've developed an outpatient total joint replacement program that can quickly help your practice and your ASC implement outpatient total joint replacements. We have a vast amount of process templates that you saw throughout the presentation. We have education guides. We have tools to help you in business planning. But probably most importantly, we have expertise people that can come on site and work with you directly to customize and implement your program. We help you to implement an outpatient joint replacement program from the ground up. We help you to create a delivery model based upon patient selection. We help you to implement very defined preoperative, perioperative, and postoperative processes. And we help you to embed all of this into a value proposition, helping you to deliver the best outpatient joint replacement care at the lowest possible cost. And when you do this, we help you then to promote it to your market, in your market, to both patients and then also to your payers. So if you have any questions or need any help in outpatient joint care, please reach out to us at 724-799-8210 or email us at info at Thanks again for your time today.